Welcome to Here Now for Tuesday, January 16th. We start tonight in Deer Lake, where some residents are preparing for a possible evacuation tonight because of rising water in the Humber River. Town staff, along with RCMP and the fire department, are going door to door, handing out colorful flyers and checking with residents who may have any medical emergencies. I want to show you why an evacuation may be necessary. The water is rapidly rising in certain areas of Deer Lake. The town wants residents to be able to move quickly if the water levels continue to rise. Riverbank Road will be closed to the public, limiting access near the water. Water is flowing into people's backyards. The local RV park is flooded. The water level is exceptionally high near Nicholsville Bridge. And just an hour ago, here's what Mayor Dean Ball had to say. This is likely to happen right, right, right now. We, uh, we are looking at the wind and ice. Um, uh, it's, it's, and we don't want to uh, wait too long. We, we certainly don't want to do this in the middle of the night. Um, again, we are still uh, very, uh, we are preparing for the worst. Oh, and, uh, but, um, you know, it's, it's obvious now that, 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 that the worst case scenario is, 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 is starting to play out. So we are preparing for that now to, uh, to get those people out. Ball says it is important residents preparing some belongings now in case they have to leave very quickly. Uh, today, uh, they were checking out the dangerously high water level. Here on Pine Tree Drive, the land is starting to give way. Residents move their trailer from the backyard, but the land is slipping into the rushing water and ice. Many people have fishing platforms or wharves along the Humber River. Today, people tried to take up their wharf before it washed away. The heavy rain Saturday pushed massive amounts of ice down the Humber River near Nicholsville Bridge. The water has not stopped rising. Just all the ice from the upper Humber broke up and came down all in one shot. So it was, uh, it was pretty crazy. You know, I've lived here for 35 years now. And, uh, you know, I've never ever seen the river that high or, or that much ice come down through there at one time. Usually it breaks up in the, the springtime and, uh, you know, it comes down in, in smaller pieces and, you know, it's not so much danger. But, uh, yeah, it was pretty crazy the amount of uh, force and power that was, you know, behind the water. That sounds pretty serious, Ryan. What is the latest on the rising water? Well, talking about, again, the rising water, but also that ice coming in. And last night we talked about municipal affairs and environment, talking about the fact that while things were dropping at Reedville or appeared to be, they were worried about some of the ice holding some of that mm -hmm. water back. And it, it appears that some of that ice and water has let go today. Let's have a look at the latest here. This is, of course, uh, what we were showing you last night and a great tool that we can use to zoom in and show you. There's, the, of course, the Humber, and we'll zoom in and show you that Reedville location. And notice how last night we were talking about it dropping, but a spike today. And there may be an anomaly here with some of that ice coming in and uh, messing with the sensor a little bit, but... Nonetheless, a bit of a rise here in water levels at Reedville, certainly through the last 12 hours or so. And perhaps uh, that's why uh, getting folks at least prepared for the possible evacuation further downstream. Now, here is, of course, the Deer Lake generating station, which continues to rise. Still not quite to that one in 20 year flood level, but uh, getting awfully close. And we'll back things out here a little bit further and down towards, of course, the Humber Village Bridge. It also continues to rise here further downstream again above the high flow alert line, not quite to the one in 20 year flood flow, but obviously keeping very close eye on the situation here. Our officials on the Humber River in western parts of Newfoundland. And thanks, uh, Ryan. Well, as you can imagine, there's a lot of construction work happening on the West Coast as a result of the weekend flooding. Earlier today, Anthony Germain headed to Little Rapids to speak with one of the people doing that work. Well, the challenge the workers here face is they've got to take all these busted up old culverts that were destroyed by the pounding water when it came through and they have to replace them with new pipes, these brand new ones over here. The difficulty is it's getting really, really cold and talking to some of the workers over here, that means a few problems, one of which is that the uh, equipment freezes up. It's pretty hard on the men as well who are working here. So far I've seen only men and the issue is that down this way on Route 450 yesterday, they were worried about the road caving in, so they weren't even allowed to bring in the heavy rock and fill to actually fix this to connect both sides of Route 450.
tell me what happened here. Well, we had that unusually warm temperatures and in torrential rainfall. The brook here, Rattlers Brook, got overwhelmed with snow melt from off the top of the tablelands, came down through the valley here and overwhelmed the pipes that were in the road and washed the works out. Okay, so what is it that you guys have to achieve here? What are you, what are you trying to do? Well, we're trying to fix the road, but also trying to put back infrastructure that would be capable of handling a large volume of water. So that matter, we're putting in, there was two pipes here originally, now we're putting in three. Two of them are considered as overflows, one will be the main pipe. Okay, so that means when this is all said and done, the, the capacity for handling the water will be greater? It will be increased, yes. Right. It's obviously challenging because it's getting cold right now. What are some of the challenges of actually getting the work done? Well, you know, you got your waters freezing again, your ground is freezing, it's slippery for the men working around here, it's harder on the equipment. It's just the time of the year. This is not the season to be doing pipe work. Right, now notice that truck that just came here, it sort of dumped its load no problem, but can you, can the rocks sometimes freeze up in the trucks? They can, if left in a little bit too long and traveling, they will sort of freeze to get on the back of the truck and dump goes up and it doesn't come out. So then you have to use an excavator to convince it it's got to come out. Convince it, good words. So the people on that side of the road, what's their situation over there? They're completely cut off by road. Right now their only access is by helicopter provided by the provincial government. And there's a couple of locals who are running back and forth between York Harbor, Lark Harbor, and Frenchman's Cove into personal longliners. Right. Now you're from this area, I take it? I've been lived here on the West Coast for over 20 years. Right. The weather that we've seen over the last few days, have you seen this kind of thing before? Not to that extreme. I have seen January thaws has been nicknamed, but not to that extreme. Right. All right. I know no one likes being asked this question, but when is this going to be finished? When we're finished. Best answer I can give you. All right. Listen, I appreciate your time. Thank you very much. No problem. Well, now to the section of the TCH where that was washed out near Little Rapids. This is where the road completely washed out. Now new culverts are installed and the land filled in. Operators with Transportation and Works Department are working round the clock to get the road open. There is a big difference in culverts, the new ones in the front, the old crumbled ones behind it that were destroyed by the large force of that road collapsing. One lane of the highway is passable, but slow. It could be a week before this is open. Well, four communities are still in a state of emergency at this point, and that's not likely to change tonight. Trout River, York Harbor, Lark Harbor, and Woody Point are all dealing with emergency situations. Severe flooding is causing concerns in Trout River and Woody Point. York Harbor, Lark Harbor have been cut off by a washout for four days now. It could be a week to 10 days before this road is repaired on a family-run farm in Little Rapids. The property damage to Hammond Farms was caused by a huge gush of water and debris. It left a hole about 10 meters deep and essentially cut the farm in half. Owner David Simmons says he's spoken with provincial government officials who say there may be financial help available because the rush of water was caused by the collapse of a nearby highway culvert. He says it'll take upwards of 10 days because many of the contractors and heavy equipment in the area are tied up fixing and repairing other roads and highways. Well, the show must go on. That's the mantra at Marble Mountain right now. After being devastated by flooding that tore deep crevices in the mountain this weekend, the ski hill is getting back to business. Lower runs will be good to go for tomorrow's big Hockey Day in Canada event when the Stanley Cup will go for a slide. All the major problems are now fixed, so crews are making more snow, helped by colder temperatures. They hope to fully reopen by the weekend. While Western Newfoundland is dealing with the wild weather from the weekend, parts of the Avalon woke up to a blast of snow and freezing rain this morning, something that made for a slippery commute and led to some frustration over the decision to keep schools in St. John's open. By mid-morning, it was cleanup time, but earlier, hail, snow and freezing rain made for a messy mix for drivers. The English School District says it didn't shut down schools in the city because its weather provider, AMEC, indicated that conditions would be safe for travel to school. And while bad weather was expected during the day, AMEC assured the board conditions would clear up before dismissal time. But the board says, ultimately, parents are the best ones to decide whether or not kids should stay at home when the weather is a concern. 
A former surgeon who worked in Labrador has been sentenced to probation for a jailhouse assault. The 55-year-old doctor raised his fists at an employee of Her Majesty's Penitentiary and pushed her a year ago. James Muanga has been sent to jail three times on charges of impaired driving and driving while disqualified. Last January, he was in prison when he became agitated. A St. John's court heard today that he pushed a civilian employee of HMP unprovoked. The woman says she hasn't been back to work since and is suffering from post-traumatic stress disorder. Judge Jacqueline Brazel says all employees deserve a safe work environment, including, including those who work at the pen. Muanga will serve 12 months probation and will have to attend counseling for his substance abuse issues. His lawyer says he lost his license to practice. Well, the controversy continues tonight at the Liquor Corporation. There are new questions about a $160 an hour job given to a man with connections to the Liberal Party. Here now is Peter Cowan explains. The Liquor Corporation is preparing for when cannabis becomes legal in July, and in order to help it get ready, it's hired Kevin Casey in order to do that. He founded the Idea Factory, and for six years, he worked with NLC on their marketing. And at issue here is the contract he's got. Let's break down some of the details. He's been hired for 10 months. He'll be paid $9,000 a month, but it's not full time. He's only expected to work 14 hours a week, so he ends up being paid $160 an hour. The chair of the board says that's about half of what Casey initially proposed. They talked him down to that rate, and he says the expertise are needed. I'm satisfied that his compensation is effectively at or below what I consider to be market for his experience and expertise level. Now the new head of the NLC has been asked to try and cut costs and that has the opposition wondering why they're giving out big contracts when they're trying to keep costs down. Uh, we've seen a new CEO brought in apparently to reduce expenditures. Right now we understand that there's a contract of nine to $10,000 per month for a private contractor to come in uh, to do some work related to uh, activities going on at NLC, which doesn't make any sense when you put it in the context of reducing cost. The finance minister, Tom Osborne, says he has no issue with the contract. He says, I trust and support the board of directors of the NLC in securing the resources they need as they undertake the monumental task of preparing for the legalization of cannabis in just a few short months. The other concern that the opposition is raising is around Casey's connections. He was at the Idea Factory when they worked on this, the liberal election advertising during the last campaign. They're wondering whether his work there helped him get the job here. Casey wouldn't do an interview, but in a message he says that before he worked for the liberals, he worked on three PC campaigns. Peter Cowan, CBC News, St. John's. What started out as a small bit of fun for a few bearded fellows in St. John's turned into a giant amount of money donated to a good cause. There's no doubt you'll remember these guys. They were part of a creative calendar that caught worldwide attention. Like Last year, members of the Newfoundland and Labrador Beard and Mustache Club posed as Merbys, a bearded male answer to the mermaid for a fundraising calendar. It was an international hit. And on the weekend, the club donated more than $300,000 to Spirit Horse NL, which uses horses to help people develop mental health and life skills. Lark Harbor, it's one of the communities on the southern shore of the Bay of Islands that still cut off.
Lark Harbor and the neighboring town of York Harbor in the Bay of Islands are still under a state of emergency tonight. Route 450, which connects them to the rest of the island, is still not passable. But things are looking up. And we've reached Mayor Melanie Joyce of Lark Harbor for an update. So, Mayor, what is the latest on getting that huge road washout repaired? So, I guess... Um Earlier today, um, the road in Johns Beach was opened again, so which meant that uh, tractors um, were coming out with materials for Rattlers Brook, so the progress is starting in there now. Any idea when the road will be passable? Um, I really don't have an idea right now. Um, I was in there a little earlier, about uh, an hour ago, and had a look at the situation. They're, they're making really good progress. So hopefully in the next day or so, we may, you know, hopefully we'll have even one lane open. But uh, I can't really give a time frame as to when, right? I'm sure it can't come fast enough for you and, and the townsfolk. <laughs> oh, absolutely. <laughs> now, I understand you were running short of some things and you've been getting some supplies in today by boat. How have you managed that? Yeah, so actually we have a, uh, we put a boat on this morning. Um, it's actually this, this vessel is part of Coast Guard Auxiliary. So they done a run this morning where they picked up supplies in Bennett's Cove, um, you know, the essentials, the milk, bread, eggs. Um, and actually we had to get fur uh, furnace uh, fuel too for a few individuals that ran out of that. So we had that transported to Lark Harbor here and uh, then they went back with uh, some people that needed to get into, uh, into Benoit's Cove. Okay, well, uh, talking about transporting people, yesterday helicopters were airlifting some people to hospital in Cornerbrook. Uh, what is the status of that today? Well, we were hoping to have the chopper running all day today, but unfortunately the weather didn't cooperate, so we didn't get any runs in until around 2 o'clock this afternoon and uh, it ran for a couple hours and transported people back and forth to, uh, to Bennett's Cove there. So, and actually tomorrow we will have two choppers on because we have our dialysis patients going once again tomorrow too as well. And how are you, we talked about food supplies and fuel and everything, how are you fixed for medical supplies, for prescriptions, for instance? Yeah, so the same thing. So we, uh, any individual that is needing a prescription, they've contacted the town, either the town of Lark Harbor or York Harbor, and we've arranged to have those medications uh, transported by Chopper uh, through Western Health and uh, once we get those, we dis uh, distribute them to the uh, residents. Mayor Joyce, just to conclude, uh, what's the mood like among people there in Lark Harbors? You can see the light at the end of this very long tunnel. Absolutely, yeah. It's, uh, you know what, it's, it's amazing to see how the town, the two towns have pulled together uh, in such need. Uh, anybody that was needing help, everybody was out there to help. We had individuals that were without water. People came and helped them, and yeah, and it was really good to see. So mm. the mood has been pretty good. Mayor Melanie Joyce, thanks once again for giving us an update. Thank you. Standing right literally at Deer Lake, of course, as you heard earlier in the, on here and now, some people here very worried they might be evacuated. Uh, the latest on that, plus meet the brains behind the company that gave you the bird's eye view of some of the horrible damage here on the West Coast.
welcome back once again. Before we get to all the weather details, let's have a look at some video recorded on the weekend during the flooding on the West Coast. Unbelievable. We know Newfoundlanders tend to make the best of any situation, and that was certainly true of Stuart Lamb and Andy Sweetland Saturday night in Cornerbrook. Lamb says they were kind of bored hanging out in the shed, so they decided to test their new dinghy and go for a float in a parking lot tied onto a truck. They're all ready for the summer season whenever that comes around. Yeah, <laughs> only about six months. Uh, wow. Six? Yeah. Uh, so Maybe. what a wild swing of weather they've had on the West Coast and what a wild swing of weather we've had here in the East yes. as well. This morning was a bit messy. You alluded to that earlier about mm -hmm. the, of course, some parents not wanting to send their kids today. It was a torrent of ice pellets uh, <laughs> coming down in Metro. And uh, Melissa Royal, snap this shot of folks skiing to work. That's one way uh, to get to work safely. Uh, hi ho, hi ho, off to work we go. And this uh, fellow was in downtown St. John's uh, skiing away to work. We never did get into the ice uh, freezing rain here in the metro region in the city of St. John's anyway. It looks like just to the south uh, that freezing rain line stayed enough to give a solid coating down in the Trapassi area. This was the scene uh, in Trapassi thanks to Clifford Dorn. You could see that ice accretion and that lighter pink color uh, shows those uh, that freezing rain line that was just south of St. John's uh, for most of the morning and even into the early afternoon. The darker purple there with the ice pellets and snow for St. John's and looks like more than 30 centimeters did track through places like Clarenville and out towards the Bonavista region uh, where that snow bullseye was expected to be. It did land there, but again, a little more in the way of ice pellets for St. John's than freezing rain. Perhaps a good thing because boy, freezing rain potential never a good thing. Now as we take a look at your latest satellite and radar sh uh, shot that is uh, that low is departing area of high pressure coming in and clearing things out and we'll calm down for oh I don't know a couple of hours and then we are of course watching our next system to move in Wednesday night in through Thursday. Here's how things time out a couple of flurries on the go tonight but by the time we get to Wednesday morning it's a very quiet start cool. Minus 7 to minus 10 for inland areas of the Buren and Avalon. Closer to minus 5 to minus 7 for coastal regions. Minus 10 to 12 for central parts of Newfoundland tonight. Closer to minus 8 in Cornerbrook. And back into the minus 20s and 30s for you folks in Labrador. That extreme cold morning continues in effect for Labrador City. Now, watch as we start through the day on Wednesday. Continues quiet. Some onshore flurries for the west coast increasing clouds through the day. So do keep that in mind. A little brighter to start. You'll need the sunglasses as you head to work. Not so much as you head home, mainly because the sun sets so early, although it is getting a little bit later. Now as we take a look at your forecast uh, for Wednesday, again, building clouds minus 2 in the southeast, minus 4 to minus 3 for central and west, minus 22 in Labrador City, and lots of sunshine across most of Labrador tomorrow. A Real true Labrador day tomorrow, a large day, lots of sunshine, uh, but cold temperatures. Now, Wednesday night in through Thursday, our next system tracks in with snow. It is going to be accumulating for the west coast into central, the northern peninsula, and southeastern Labrador here. But this looks like another mix to some ice and then rain and drizzle for central and eastern parts of Newfoundland. Temperatures are going to rise into the four or five degree range, probably even above zero for a time along the west coast, but more snow than not here, and especially into southeastern Labrador. Just getting grazed by this one in Labrador City, and here is a snapshot of that next system. So lighter snow for most of Labrador. Potential for 10 plus for western into central parts of Newfoundland. Uh, the, it'll be a tough uh, call for central where you will get into that uh, mix line with a bit of ice and rain on the go. And again, more rain than not, I think, here across the Avalon and the east. We'll talk about that coming up more with your long range right through the weekend. Now let's head back to Deer Lake and let's check in with here and now's Anthony Germain and Colleen Connors, who've had a busy, busy day on the west coast. Uh, how's it going, guys? Thanks, Ryan. Uh, it's going okay. A little bit cold. Colleen's been out here all day here in Deer Lake. You can see the power plant behind us. Pretty tense here. Very much so. So just so people have a sense, Anthony, we are standing on Deer Lake right now. We are very close to the water's edge. Ice and very cold water right behind our feet here tonight. Um, just kind of behind the camera this evening is where I was most of today. And that is where this thick, thick ice and water is starting to rise mm -hmm. and rise. 
along the Humber River, along main residential streets in Deer Lake. And it is scary. Even in the few hours that I was here today, I noticed that the water was rising. You've got this thick ice that's jammed, almost like a dam, and that ice has got to move. And that is the problem here tonight. It's quite the scene, and you should have seen people out here today. Absolutely. Colleen, appreciate that. Thank you very much. Also driving here with Colleen this night, even looking at the Humber Odd to our left as we were approaching Deer Lake, much higher than it was when we drove here a couple of days ago. I'll be talking to the mayor uh, of Deer Lake in uh, just a few minutes. First, though, I want to bring your attention to a different story. You may have noticed some of the footage of the disaster zones, for lack of a better word, the damage. Uh, some spectacular footage from the air. Well, that is not just about showing you serious damage. It's also about finding solutions to that damage. I want you to meet the brains behind the company of the people who made some of that video possible. So, Adrian, when you realized what was happening at Little Rapids, what, what were you thinking? The extent of damage. Actually, when our team originally went up there, um, you know, I didn't expect it to be in this area. I mean, the extent of damage was much larger. And to be honest with you, uh, Anthony, I didn't even know if it was a brook there. So to see the Northern Brook there and that it's actually completely washed away, I mean, the extent of damage was absolutely mind-boggling. Um, that's one of the advantages we found with the, the UAV or the, the drone, of course, is that once you get in the air and actually be able to see the site, um, the extent is what really becomes apparent. Because, I mean, when you stand on the ground and have a look, um, you know, you can see, yeah, there's a, there's a hole in the ground, but when you get up in the air and see, you know, the actual length of destruction, mm -hmm. um, it's, it's pretty, pretty severe. So that was Little Rapids. Uh, what about Rattler's Brook? Uh, Rattlers Brook, the, the same thing. I, I mean, the amount of gravel and, and uh, sediment and the, the amount of uh, stuff that's washed away was uh, absolutely extreme. Um, when we got up in the air again, it was to get an idea, the sense of scales, not even explainable until you actually see it. Uh, one of the cool things with drones is that, yes, you, you get a good um, bird's eye perspective, uh, but you also get some really, really good data. So when you take the data back to the office and you do some initial processing, you can get some really, um, really accurate, very precise 3D models and point cloud data sets, what we call right. it. Right. Now, what people might not know, and this is what I think is, is really interesting, of course, everyone's seen some of the spectacular imagery that you managed to capture on the West Coast, but also you can actually tell the department, okay, you've got this big a crater, you're going to need this much fill, right? Yeah, absolutely. So what happens is that when we take the data back and we actually do some additional analysis, um, what we can do is actually measure the amount of change. So for example, if you've got an area like down Frenchman's Cove where the road is uh, eroding, um, you can actually continuously fly that area and measure the, the amount of change that occurs in that particular landslide or floodplain, that sort of thing. What's the value of this to the engineers? Um, so what happens is if you do a typical, say, uh, topographic survey and you get a, a topo point or a measurement of the earth at uh, every five meters, we're dealing with, you know, multiple points, multiple points, X, Y, Z points mm -hmm. per square meter or cubic meter. So the amount of data that you get is immense and the precision that you get is, is, is incredible. Um, so you're getting the same level of precision as your survey, but your, your amount of data is, right. you know, the, and you get your uh, kind of your before and after because you know, for the time that it would take to go in and actually survey this conventionally versus your 15 minute flight, you've got all your data, your data's backed up, you know, and you can go back and do it again and again. Last question for you, you're a local guy, uh, this weather is quite something, what are your overall impressions of what's happened in the Cornerbrook area in the West Coast over the past few days? Uh, this is definitely the worst that I've ever seen. Um, I'm a snowmobiler, a skier as well, so to see this amount of destruction is disappointing when you look at, uh, you look at Marble, you know, and um, it's, it's very disappointing, but I haven't seen this amount of destruction, you know, an amount of flood this is it's unreal. I can't can't even elaborate. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Thank you very much. Oh, thank you. thank you. Well, a drone uh, might be handy here in Deer Lake to actually check out the Humber to see some of the accumulation of ice that uh, Colleen Connors was telling you about a bit, a bit earlier. I'm joined now by uh, the mayor of uh, of this fine municipality. Uh, thank you for coming. Thank you. So. Have you had any drone footage taking a look at the Humber and the, and the ice? No, uh, we actually in a in a no in a no fly zone. We are gonna we're gonna seek some uh, some uh, information to try and see if we can get a bit of that tomorrow on Pine Tree Drive. Now this evening uh, we reported that you were actually talking to people, warning them of the possibility of an evacuation. What's it like when you go door to door in Deer Lake and say, "Hey, you might have to leave your home." Well, you know, a lot of our residents are used to hearing uh, eye water marks and eye uh, and, uh, and and flooding. Uh, I, my advice tonight is just we've got to take this a, a, a serious. Uh, we're used to this in, in uh, April months and this, and this kind of time frame. Uh, very rarely do we ever see this in January when our ground is froze. The water is actually on top of the, on top of the ice. Right, that means that 
in the event that you have water and a lot of it, it has nowhere to go, right? Exactly, and this is what's going to cause the, the, the flooding, the seeking into basements and, and uh, personal property and houses. So we are very concerned. It is uh, just, you know, the residents have been very patient with us. Today we've uh, left notices in houses that, that families are weren't home. We've talked to a, a, lot of, a lot of people. And again, people are, you know, are understanding where we're coming from, that this is a safety precaution right now. And in the event we have the Red Cross, every, everything is in order. An evacuation um, a building has been, the Pentecostal church here is gonna be the, the, uh, the place for that. So we're prepared. All right, as far as options go, uh, is dynamite something that can be used in this? Well, one of our conference calls today, we were told that uh, dynamite is not going to be an option. Uh, we're out there seeking other uh, sources now, whether it's a uh, long arm excavator on a barge. Uh, we've made That would be to scoop out as much yes. as it could, right? Yeah, we need a channel from the river down through through the ice pack that's in, at, that's in our lake behind us. And uh, if we could get a channel down through that to hope open up and relieve some of that water pressure, then the water is backing up. The ice is serving as a dam now, and we could get some of that uh, pressure off of that. We could get that water elevation down. So um, that's what we're continuing on to work on tonight and, and throughout tomorrow morning. Did you call the Premier and say, hey, what's going on? <laughs> the Premier's around. <laughs> the Premier's been around all day and saying, hey, listen, it's, it's, it's good to have a, have, a, have a voice. You can, you can, you can ask questions back and right. forth and suggestions and ideas. It's, it's, it's a, it's a great, it's, he's a great sounding board. I can imagine. Um, Mr. Ball, thank you very much and uh, good luck. We'll keep our eyes on the story. Uh, I appreciate your time tonight. Thank you very much. All right. Well, that's the mayor. We'll keep our eyes on the story. And uh, Debbie, I guess I'll say uh, hi to you and I'll throw things back to you, Debbie Cooper. Okay, thanks so much, Anthony. And you'll be back here in St. John's tomorrow, so look forward to seeing you here. Weather permitting. <laughs> Weather permitting. <laughs> okay, thanks. Latest on MHA Eddie Joyce breaks down how and when federal assistance will be delivered. The MHA for Bay of Islands is back at Confederation Building today. Eddie Joyce has spent since Saturday in his district surveying the devastation following all that rain and flooding which impacted roads and so many towns and communities in the area. And Mr. Joyce is joining me now. Um, 
We have just heard uh, the latest on Deer Lake, but what about other communities in your district? Well, in, in our district right now, there's two and they're still under state emergency, York Harbor and Lark Harbor. They're mm -hmm. cut off from Route 450. The town of Humber South, uh, 3 o'clock, lifted their state of emergency. So in our area, there, there's two under the state of emergency. Uh, Trout River and Woody Point are still under the state of emergency, and that's the only four right now. Let's talk about uh, assistance to the towns, the communities, individuals. Uh, how does the federal assistance work? Um, the way it works is, is, of course, we had to apply to the federal government for the assistance. Uh, the first $1.6 million is total 100% provincial share. Uh, the next $3.2 million uh, is cost share between federal and provincial. The next $3.2 million is 75-25 federal provincial. And above that, anything above that will be 90-10 from the federal government. So we're very confident that we're going to re reach well over the $1.6 million and this disaster uh, application will be sent uh, to the minister. Uh, I want to talk about infrastructure. A lot of culverts were replaced after Igor um, and some are wondering how come these didn't last, didn't hold or withstand all this flooding? Well Igor was an example of why it should be changed. Uh, the change now is that there, there's a 15% variance in the total cost or 15% in if you want to make something bigger, for example, a culvert. Uh, if you put back the same 20-inch culvert, there's a good chance that it may flood again. But if you can put back another 15%, a 30-inch culvert, which is, has greater capacity, or a bridge a bit bigger. So the federal government did change the criteria. Um, before in the disaster uh, mitigation program, you had to put back the exact same piece of equipment that came out. Now you can make it much larger. You can make a decision yourself. 15% uh, doesn't seem much larger, though, and, and our storms seem to be getting yeah. worse. Um, but it's 15% of the total project. So okay. if the project was a million dollars. You, you can make a 15%. It's all up to you where you want to spend it. Okay. So 15% of the whole project, a lot of covers, they, they make them bigger. So it's 15% of the project itself. In a lot of other cases, you can make the covers 15%, the bridges 15%. But you can, if some places where you don't need to put in that extra money, you could put it in other parts of the disaster. Okay. Let's talk about individual homeowners. Mm -hmm. uh, I did hear one man saying, no insurance. Are people like him out of luck, or what can the province do for someone like that? Uh, well, this is where the disaster um, uh, program comes in place, is that if you don't have insurance, and um, once we apply and meet the threshold for the federal government, we will be making an application. And uh, actually, that is why I'm in here in St. John's now. Uh, there's a process we had to go through uh, to get the website and get the applications ready. So. We put up this morning about people and towns uh, that need applications or need to apply, uh, what's, what's available, uh, what the criteria is, and actual fact, I'm bringing back a box load of applications, drop them off to the towns tomorrow uh, on the, uh, in the South Shore, and North Shore, and in Deer Lake area tomorrow. So there's still hope for somebody like that person? Uh, those people will fall under, under the federal disaster program, and it, for, for the disa federal disaster program, it is for infrastructure for towns and also individuals. Okay. So it's both. So, so yes, we, we are well aware of the individuals. Uh, I've been through this several times before. And what I've told people on many occasions, everything you got, if you gotta, if you gotta take out your carpet, keep it there, like it, make sure when the appraisers come by, you have proof that it's done. And then applications are on the way to all the individuals and towns. Eddie Joyce, thanks very much for being here. Uh, thank you very much. And thanks to all the volunteers that helped out during this disaster. Well, hell, on a day like this, when Ryan went to school, it's not hard to guess what the most popular question was.
Okay, let's meet our young athlete of today. This is eight-year-old Kylie Walsh of St. John's. Kylie plays tackle football with the Avalon Miners Football League and also takes part in competitive cheerleading. Way to go, Kylie. You're today's young athlete of the day. The weather update is brought to you by Belltone Hearing Service St. John's. Helping the world hear better. So we're getting back on track with your school visits. Mm -hmm. We were in another classroom this morning. How That's did right. that go? It went great. I was in St. Matthew's Elementary School in St. John's. Now, I went in there with my head low, <laughs> not just watching for the kids, but the teachers. Uh, I went into the staff room, but everybody had a great uh, sense of humor, of course, that uh, could have been maybe a, kind of a snow day here in St. John's or a delayed opening. But anyway, everyone trucked in <laughs> and we had a great visit. And uh, here's a little welcome from the kids. Yeah! <laughs> Lots of enthusiasm there. Absolutely. Go Tigers. Uh, so uh, thanks to St. Matthew's Elementary and uh, the grade five classes and uh, the teachers that were very, very welcoming, even on this potential snow day. And did you get, get some really interesting questions as always? I really did. <laughs> like, why wasn't today a snow day? But also uh, we talked about pre precipitation types and ice pellets versus freezing rain and always. And we didn't get hail today. No, we didn't get hail today. <laughs> hail only in the summer. Uh, <laughs> anyway, I, that's like the one thorn on my side constantly, right? Uh, now, speaking of cold weather and mixed precipitation, how about the U.S.? I was just showing you this map. Unreal. Can you imagine if you were, say, down in southern Texas trying to beat the heat this January? Have a look at this. Right now, Houston, Texas is the same temperature as St. John's, Newfoundland, minus three. Oh, I would not like to be vacationing looking for the warmth and getting that. <laughs> How about being in Myrtle Beach right now? Seven degrees. Even Arizona, which is usually, you know, kind of shielded, it's only 23 in Phoenix right now which, you know, is not hot, that's for sure. Now, this is going to ease for those folks in the southern U.S. By the way, snow today in Oklahoma, Texas, Louisiana, and Alabama as this cold air plunges down the jet stream. I've got it overlaid here. You can see where it is dipping down along this frontal boundary where we have the cold air and the warm air clashing. This is where we're going to be seeing our next low developing. Hasn't developed yet, but it will do so over the next 24 hours. That's going to be shooting into our neck of the woods and bringing us some snow, but also some ice pellets, freezing rain and rain. Not quite as much as we had just this last round, last night into today, which is now departing, but the next low will be bringing some snow for some of us. And here's how things will play out. Increasing clouds tomorrow, a pretty quiet day overall. Watch your timeline. Wednesday evening into the overnight. This is when our next snow moves in by Thursday morning. A bit of a dry punch here possible, but uh, this could be filled in with a bit of mixed precipitation, some ice pellets and freezing rain. This is just one forecast model, of course, and you can see where better chance we're into some showers and even some periods of rain, not out of the question, into the afternoon for a time. Central and eastern parts of Newfoundland. Snow continues up into southeastern parts of Labrador. Looks like the best chance of 10 centimeters or more will be the northwestern half of the island, especially north of Cornerbrook towards the northern peninsula and southeastern Labrador. Lighter snow for most of the big land. And it looks like a good portion of the island, especially the Avalon and eastern Newfoundland, getting into that rain and mostly rain, I think, uh, after a little bit of ice pellet freezing rain action into the early morning hours of Thursday. Now for Friday, bit of a clear out, some onshore flurries still possible on the west coast. Our weekend system, if you do have some travel plans, keep this in mind. Looks like a quick mover, but some snow accumulation possible for some of us. Perhaps another brief mix over for Saturday night into Sunday on the Avalon. And then that one clears out pretty quickly as well. So uh, not a big system for the weekend, but it's certainly one I'm going to keep you posted on over the next couple of days as lots of folks traveling this time of year. And here is a look at that seven day, which you can see we're bottoming out temperatures into the Friday, Saturday time period. And then that system comes in, bit of a rise, and then some cooler air greets us for early next week. But a bit of a, of a calm spell with another system potential for Wednesday into Thursday of next week that will dive into more over the next couple of days. And there's your uh, trend for Labrador, which again, best snow potential certainly for Thursday and into Friday. Debbie? 
Thanks very much, Ryan. Well, a fishing captain from this province who made international headlines in 1986 has died. Gus Dalton was the man who discovered and then helped save more than 150 Tamil refugees who were drifting in open lifeboats six miles off the coast of St. Shots. Dalton took half of them on his longliner and called the Coast Guard to help rescue the others. I had paid for them and sitting on the water, as far as I was concerned, when we saw them first. They were just sitting on the water, no sign of any boat at all, you know. So I still can see, can see that in my mind. And I also, you know, think that any people that do that for freedom, and for their freedom, I mean, I say whatever country they certainly deserve it, I would say that. At a reunion a few years ago, many of the Sri Lankan refugees returned to the province to thank Dalton for his efforts. Gus Dalton passed away last night at the age of 87. His funeral will be held Saturday in Admiral's Beach. And now south of the border, a California couple is facing charges of torture and child endangerment in what police call a horrific abuse case. It came to light when a 17-year-old girl escaped her family home over the weekend. Today, authorities described what they found when they rescued her 12 emaciated brothers and sisters. Steve Futterman reports. This is the home where it occurred. In posed pictures, it may have looked like a normal and happy family. The reality, authorities say, was much different. Three children shackled with chains and padlocks to beds and other furniture. There was very little light. There was a very foul smell inside the residence. Um, it was extremely dirty. And uh, as we reported uh, previously, uh, many of the children were malnourished. At their first news conference, officials described how one of the children made initial contact with authorities. A 17-year-old girl called 911 from a deactivated cell phone and reported that her siblings were being held against their will and some were chained. And she explained that she had escaped through a window uh, from, from that residence. When police arrived at the home, at least one of the parents seemed confused. But it seemed that the mother was perplexed as to why we were uh, at, at that residence. Meanwhile, at the home, neighbors continued to talk about things they'd seen, things that might have been clues as to what was taking place. All 13 of the siblings, ranging in age from 2 to 29, are now all in hospitals. They seem to be doing well. They are safe right now. I think they feel safe. I can share that with you. The parents, though, remain in jail as the district attorney prepares to formally accuse them of a series of crimes that could possibly put them in prison for the rest of their lives. Steve Futterman for CBC News, Paris, California. Nominations for the Canadian Screen Awards were announced today. They're for the best in both film and television production, like a combination of the Emmys and the Oscars. The winners will be announced in March. Maudie, a film shot in Newfoundland, is up for seven awards, including Best Motion Picture. It's about Nova Scotia artist Maud Lewis. The Breadwinner is also up for Best Picture. It's an animated feature about an Afghan girl who disguises herself as a boy to support her family. In television, the series Anne, based on Lucy Maud Montgomery's classic novel, has 13 nominations, followed with 12 nominations each are Cardinal, adapted from the detective novel set in Northern Ontario. And Kim's Convenience, a comedy about a family running a downtown corner store. Well, I can tell you this. When we put together our top 50 pictures of the year at the end of this year, this will certainly be on it. It's beautiful. <laughs> Love this pic. And of course, with the freeze up on the West Coast, ice, ice everywhere. That's my only clue that it's on the West Coast. Try and guess where. And we'll tell you after the break.
Welcome back, everyone. Well, can you dig it? A group of nine volunteer explorers from a Calgary-based expedition have found what's believed to be Canada's deepest cave. It's called Bizarro Anima, and it's on a remote plateau near Fernie, B.C. It's 670 meters deep and 5.3 kilometers long. It's the longest shaft, uh, its longest shaft rather, works out to the equivalent of a 35-story office building. The crew had to spend a week underground to map it all out, and they still haven't reached the full depths of the system, leaving no stone unturned in the name of scientific exploration. Ooh, glad somebody could do it. <laughs> well, rescuers went above and beyond to save a herd of endangered caribou. Just have a look. That is a helicopter rescuing a caribou off an island on Lake Superior. The animals need to be airlifted and relocated because they're being targeted by a pack of wolves. The wolves came across the frozen lake in 2013. Since then, the caribou herd has rapidly depleted from 700 to just 100. The Ministry of Natural Resources and Forestry says uh, they are hoping to rebuild the herd and sometime return them to the island. Wow, amazing what can happen when one species comes into an area that they haven't been, yeah. you know? Yeah, it was great for the wolves. <laughs> yeah, when really. 700 to 100 in what was that, uh, less than four years. Yeah, amazing, yeah. amazing. You wonder too, with uh, the, the more coyotes, wolves, uh, koi wolves, as David Suzuki calls them, because mm -hmm. they're all mixed now, what influence that'll have on the island is uh, numbers seem to be rising in sightings anyway. Mm -hmm. So over the next couple of years on uh, the caribou and moose population. Anyway, I digress. Uh, we want to show you now our beautiful weather picture of the day. Man, I love this shot. It is. It is so nice and pure joy. <laughs> Absolutely. For me, <laughs> even such looking at it. a smooth surface, which is really hard to get lots of times with our winds, Absolutely. always ripples all over the yeah, ice. Yeah, that's right. Now, <laughs> this was taken in Port of Basque. Of course, they had the big warm up there and uh -huh. then the big freeze and a rapid freeze. And so, like you said, the ponds are like <laughs> glass now and uh, no need for a Zamboni with uh, with that. And I uh, want to, of course, uh, give a big shout out to Trina Cook from Port of Basque. And, uh, thanks for uh, taking the time to send that picture along to facebook.com slash ryan.snodden where so many of you have been doing that. Uh, thanks so much. And that's how you can enjoy winter. Yes. When the weather cooperates. Yes. No <laughs> pressure, right, <laughs> Debbie? <laughs> thanks very much, Ryan. You're thanks welcome. to all of you for joining us. Have a great night. We'll be back here tomorrow. Good night.